Dr. Dixit has been serving the religious and cultural needs of Queen's residents, as well as individuals in the Tri-State area. The Hindu Center is a nonprofit organization that works to bring communities together under the teachings of Hindu religion and works to carry on the traditions, heritage, and wisdom of past sages so that our future generations may have the knowledge, strength, wisdom, and peace they deserve. Aside from his role as a spiritual leader within the Hindu community, Dr. Dissit has shown us the importance of never abandoning your passions and living a full life by always striving to be involved in his community and serving as a role model for others. He's well known in the Hindu community on the East Coast, not just for his role in the temple, but also for his roles in several movies, including popular uh, movies like Name Shake and ABCD, in which he played a priest. For the last six years, Dr. Dissit has blessed our council by spreading the invocation prayers, uh, invocations at the New York City Council's Diwali celebrations. I would like to thank Dr. Dissit for being here today and make a motion for unanimous consent to spread the invocation full upon the record. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member Ku. We will now have the adoption of minutes by Council Member Robert Holden. I make a motion that the minutes of the stated meeting of October 7th, 2021 be adopted as printed. Thank you. Messages and papers from the mayor? None. Communication from city, county, and borough offices. M345, Controller Annual Report. Received, ordered, printed, and filed. M346, City Planning Commission Appointment. Rules, privileges, and elections. Petitions and communications. None. Land use call-ups. None. Thank you. We will now have communication from Speaker Corey Johnson. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. Good afternoon. Happy Wednesday. Welcome to today's stated meeting. I want to remind all members that masks are required to be worn throughout the stated, even when speaking. Today, we're voting on 13 bills to strengthen our city and tackle some of the many challenges that we are facing. Some of the bills include a legislative, some of the bills included in this legislative package are to help increase construction safety and to build attract COVID cases in our city schools. Uh, last week was election day, a historic one for the city and for our legislative body. I want to congratulate all of the winners of their elections. Particularly, I want to congratulate Mayor-elect Eric Adams, who will become the city's 110th mayor and the second African-American mayor in New York City's history. I want to uh, congratulate uh, some of our colleagues. Congratulations to Councilmember Brad Lander, who will become the city's next controller. I want to congratulate and give a round of applause. I want to congratulate public advocate Jumani Williams on his re-election, and I want to congratulate all of the borough presidents-elect, especially those who are our colleagues, uh, Council Members uh, Vanessa Gibson, Council Member Mark Levine, and Council Member Antonio Reynoso. We are proud of all of you, and I want to congratulate each one of you. Uh, so to the members of this body, Brad, Antonio, Vanessa and Mark, congratulations. They will, along with the new City Council, help lead our city as we continue to recover from COVID-19. History was in the making for the City Council, especially New Yorkers elected a council that will become one of the most diverse in our history. And uh, I am so uh, grateful to say this, happy to say this, for the first time in the history of this body, the majority of the members in the next council will be women. Additionally, the council will be welcoming the first Muslim woman council member, the first Korean American council members, the first South Asian American members, and the first 
uh, openly LGBTQ black women members. So congratulations to all of them. Uh, we look forward to seeing what they do and are rooting for their success in the future. Tomorrow is Veterans Day. I want to acknowledge and thank all veterans for their selfless service to our nation. They have sacrificed all for our country and our gratitude for their service is endless. I, of course, want to remember my father, uh, Rodney Richardson, who was a United States Marine Corps member and served during Vietnam. He died in 2012. He was only in his mid-50s. And happy Diwali to all those who celebrated last week, a significant holiday observed by many around the world. November is National American Indian Heritage Month, a time to remember our nation's first people and celebrate their contributions, culture, and traditions. This month is also Puerto Rican Heritage Month, and we celebrate the many contributions of Puerto Rican New Yorkers. And uh, many of us who were in Puerto Rico this past week participating in the annual SOMOS conference. Both Puerto Ricans and Native Americans have made contributions, endless contributions, that have shaped our city, and we are really proud that they are honored this month. We are, of course, still suffering from COVID-19. We will continue to battle this pandemic until the suffering has ended for all. As of November 9th, <clears throat> we have lost 34,000 647 New Yorkers to COVID-19. 34,647 New Yorkers to COVID-19. It is an absolutely devastating number to think about, and we collectively send our deepest condolences to the families and friends of those who we have lost. Let us pause for a moment of silence for all of those who have died from COVID-19, if folks would stand. Thank you. Now jumping into our docket for the day, out of the Finance Committee, the Council will vote on a transparency resolution and three Article 11 property tax exemptions. Culver EL Phase 1 in Councilmember Brad Landers District will receive a three-year extension of, his, of its existing full exemption to support the new construction of 36 affordable condo units. 55 Summit, also in Councilmember Landers District, will receive a full 40-year exemption to support the new construction of five affordable co-op units. Revive 103 in Councilmember Diana Ayala's District will receive a partial 40-year exemption to support the preservation of 59 affordable rental units. The Council will also vote on the following land use items. TMN 1002 West Harlem Renaissance, a UDAP and tax exemption to facilitate the preservation of two buildings, including 51 affordable rental units in Council Member Bill Perkins's district. 624 Morris Avenue, a commercial overlay to allow longstanding businesses to continue to operate in Council Member Rafael Salamanca's district. River North, as modified, will facilitate the development of three new mixed use buildings with approximately 625 units of housing, 188 of which will be affordable. Our modifications will reduce the bulk of the proposed buildings and area to be rezoned in Councilmember Debbie Rose's district. 270 Nostrand Avenue rezoning as modified would facilitate the development of a 14-story mixed-use building with 487 units of housing in Councilmember Robert Cornegie's district. 1776 48th Street rezoning as modified will facilitate the development of a new three-story mixed-use building in Councilmember Calman Yeager's district. Moving on, the Council will vote on the following legislation. Introduction number 2168A, sponsored by Councilmember Justin Brannon, and it is out of the Committee on Environmental Protection. This bill will restore public and consumer access to critical water meter information that was eliminated in 2019. This bill requires the Commissioner of Environmental Protection to create a searchable online database through which anyone who registers and pays a periodic subscription fee may access information relating to water meters with the exception of one to three family homes. Such information would include but not be limited to water meter billing data and balances, consumption usage, and technical information about the water meter. I want to thank from the staff, Lewis Children Brown. Next, we're voting on introduction number 1894A, sponsored by Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, which will require that a bias audit be conducted on automated employment decision tools prior to the use of such tools in connection with screening candidates for employment or employees 
for promotion within New York City. Automated employment decision tools use machine learning, artificial intelligence, and other processes to assist employers in evaluating candidates for hire or promotion. Often employers may be unaware of automated employment decision tools internal me mechanics and the potential for such tools to produce assessments that replicate various forms of bias within labor markets. In order to evaluate such tools prior to use, the disclosure of a summary of a bias audit by an independent auditor could serve to prevent the use of tools with implicit biases. The legislation would also require that candidates or employees that reside in the city be notified about the use of such tools in the assessment or evaluation for hire or promotion, as well as being notified about qualifications and characteristics that will be used by automated employment decision tools into the decision-making process. Candidates or employees would also be permitted to request certain additional information about such tool. The legislation should increase transparency, protect New York City residents from bias, and promote equal opportunities regardless of their gender or skin color. This local law would take effect on January 1st, 2023. And from the staff, I want to thank Irene Bajofsky and Stephanie Jones. Next is Introduction 2410A, sponsored by Councilmember Selvina Brooks Powers, and it is out of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. Unfortunately, data breaches have become ever more frequent, including databases kept by city agencies, and it has been critical to notify individuals whose data has been impacted when a breach occurs. This bill would strengthen data breach responses by city agencies by updating our local news, local laws, to promote notifications to affected persons when their private information has been compromised and codifying agency response to data breaches affecting the city. The Office of Cyber Command, the Department of Information Technology and Tele Telecommunications, and the Chief Privacy Officer would work together in responding to these incidents. This bill <clears throat> would make our local data breach notification law more protective and ensure a robust city uh, to ensure, sorry, this bill will make our data breach notification law more protective, ensure a robust city response to data breaches going forward, and ensure the city is aligned with state, state law. And from the staff, I want to thank Stephanie Jones. Moving on, the next two bills are all sponsored by Council Member Steve Levin and come out of the committee he chairs, the Committee on General Welfare. Introduction number 1232A will require the Department of Homeless Services to create a sign and other relevant materials that inform residents of homeless shelters of various rights related to shelter transfers, including the right to request an agency conference and to fear hearing to challenge the adequacy of their shelter placement. Such signs must be displayed conspicuously at all homeless shelters and related facilities. Such signs must also be available on the Department of Homeless Services website in each of the designated citywide languages. The next bill, again by Chair Levin, is introduction number 20, it's 1233A, which will require the Department of Homeless Services to provide written notification to shelter residents at least 48 hours prior to any non-emergency shelter transfer. The notification would include a detailed summary of reasons for the transfer, the name and address of the shelter the client is being transferred to, and language about how a client can obtain a copy of their case record. Additionally, it will require that the same information be provided to clients affected by emergency transfers no later than 48 hours after the emergency transfer. The legislation would require the Department of Homeless Services to submit an annual report on the number of emergency transfers and non-emergency transfers disaggregated by shelter type and the reason for the transfers. And I want to thank from the staff for both these bills, Aminta Kilowan, who did an amazing job. Uh, I'm really grateful for Aminta's hard work. Uh, next up, we're voting on introduction number 957A from the Committee on Parks and Recreations, sponsored by Councilmember Joe Borelli. This bill will limit the number of replacement trees that are required by, to be planted by the Department of Parks and Recreations by individuals and by entities that lawfully remove trees during construction projects in certain lower density residential districts. And I want to thank from the staff, Chris Sartori. As we continue to battle the pandemic, we have two bills from our Committee on Education. They are sponsored by its chair, Councilmember Mark Traeger, aimed at tracking uh, down the spread of COVID in our schools. Introduction number 2426A would require the Department of Education to publicly post daily on their website attendance data disaggregated citywide 
and disaggregated by, by the school for the previous day and previous week. The DOE is also required to publicly post every two weeks in the aggregate and disaggregated by school the number of students partially vaccinated for COVID-19 in attendance, the number of students fully or partially vaccinated for COVID-19, the number of COVID-19 testing consent forms received from families, the number of consent forms withdrawn, and the number of unvaccinated students required to quarantine because of exposure in school to an individual who tested positive for COVID-19. The data will be disaggregated by grade level, gender, race, or ethnicity, individualized education program status, English language learner status, status as a student residing in a shelter, and status as a student in temporary housing that is not a shelter. Introduction number 2427A will require that the Department of Education to release on, to, to report on its website every two weeks positive COVID-19 cases among administrators, teachers, students, and other school staff in every DOE school. The reporting will also include which schools have been closed due to COVID-19 and the number of classrooms that have been closed due to COVID-19. The Department of Education additionally will be required to report on the number of administrators, teachers, students, and other school staff who have been fully or partially vaccinated for COVID-19. The student reporting metrics will be reported on a monthly basis in a disaggregated way by grade level, gender, race, or ethnicity, individualized education program status, English language learner status, status as a student residing in a shelter, and status as a student in temporary housing that is not a shelter. And I want to thank from the staff for these two bills, Malcolm Butehorn and Michelle Lee. Moving on, we're voting on a bill aimed to help curb worker exploitation by body shops who at times take advantage of justice affected New Yorkers. Introduction number 2318A, sponsored by Councilmember Diana Ayala and from the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing, will license construction businesses that employ workers for minimum wage while supplying their labor to real estate contractors at a profit. These quote unquote body shops often target formerly incarcerated people of color who would otherwise struggle to find work but need work in order to comply with their parole agreements. Once employed, these individuals become part of a power imbalance that can result in dangerous working conditions. Workers have reported unsafe work sites, missing PPE, and sexual harassment on the job. Businesses subject to this bill would have to provide their workers with advance notice about their rights, upcoming work assignments, and required trainings. They'd also have to provide the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection with key information on their business operations, like the wages and benefits they provide their workers. Exploitative businesses can lose their license to operate and receive civil penalties. Developers too can be penalized if they use body shops that aren't licensed. Under this bill, workers would be protected from retaliation and could bring court action against body shops that don't follow the law. And from the staff, I want to thank Stephanie Jones, Leah Skripiak, and Noah Meixler. Finally, we're voting on a legislative package to help increase safety at construction sites. The four bills come out of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. First, introduction number 2263A, sponsored by Committee Chair Councilman Robert Cornegie. In 2017, the City Council enacted Local Law 196, requiring safety training for workers and supervisors at large construction sites. In 2018, the Department of Buildings consolidated the existing Building Enforcement Safety Team Excavation Interior Demolition Unit and scaffold safety unit into a new construction safety compliance unit, which is called the CSC. The CSC conducts proactive, unannounced inspections of larger construction sites, including those required to designate a construction superintendent, site safety coordinator, and site safety manager. In 2019, construction-related injuries decreased by over 20% compared to the previous year. This bill seeks to build on efforts to reduce construction-related injuries and fatalities by lowering the threshold for a major building construction site and thereby subjecting more construction sites to Department of Buildings heightened safety requirements. Previously, major buildings were defined as construction sites that involved existing or proposed buildings, 10 or more stories, or 125 feet or more in height. This bill will lower those thresholds to seven or more stories or 75 feet or more in height, respectively. Lowering these thresholds will trigger additional site safety requirements for more construction sites. Also sponsored by Council Member Cornegie is introduction number 2264A, which will amend the special inspection requirements 
for cold form steel with respect to bracing. This bill will also create new requirements for cold form steel light frame construction for the installation of decking on cold form cold formed steel light frame construction as well as the use of such framing and decking during construction or demolition operations. Cold form steel is formed through near room temperature processes as opposed to structural steel which is formed using molten iron. According to the Department of Buildings, cold form steel is commonly used in construction and is safe, reliable, and cost effective. However, like all steel construction, it must be used properly. Overloading and the improper installation of cold form steel can result in injury and property damage. In 2019, the Department of Buildings issued a bulletin to highlight requirements specific to the erection of cold form steel light frame construction for special inspectors, construction superintendents, general contractors, design professionals, and permit holders. To further improve the safety of cold form steel construction, this, build, this bill builds upon the Department of Buildings bulletin and outreach by creating new requirements for cold form steel light frame construction, the installation of decking on cold form steel light frame construction, as well as the use of such framing and decking during construction and demolition operations. The third bill in the legislative package is introduction number 2276A, sponsored by Councilmember Francisco Moya. This bill seeks to build on efforts to reduce construction-related injuries and fatalities by requiring additional site safety supervision at major building construction sites. In addition to requiring a full-time site safety coordinator or site safety manager, such sites would also be required to designate a full-time construction superintendent who will be responsible for safety and code compliance along with overall management of the construction project. This bill provides that a construction superintendent may only serve as a construction superintendent for one job if that job is a major building job. This bill also establishes limits on the number of non-major building jobs a construction superintendent may serve on at any one time, with a multi-year phase-in timeline for this change beginning on June 1st, 2022 until January 1st, 2026. Beginning January 2026, Beginning January 1st, 2026, construction superintendents must be present at the job site for which they are responsible during all times when active work is occurring or a competent person must be present when the construction superintendent is not. The fourth and final bill is introduction number 2262A and it is sponsored by Chair Cornegie. The New York City construction codes require that the Department of Buildings or a registered design professional perform a final inspection upon the completion of work in all cases where permitted work does not require the issuance of a certificate of occupancy. The purpose of these inspections is to confirm that the work is in compliance with construction documents approved by the Department of Buildings. These final inspections are required even for temporary construction equipment, such as sidewalk sheds, construction fences, and scaffolds. These final inspections occur after the equipment has been removed and are not a good use of resources for DOB or for building owners who hired registered design professionals to perform such inspections. Section one of this bill would eliminate this final inspection requirement for such temporary construction equipment, streamlining the sign-off process for permits issued in connection with that equipment. In 2019, the Department of Buildings issued Buildings Bulletin 2019-006, prohibiting the installation or use of a standoff bracket after identifying their use as, as a contributing factor and suspended scaffolding incidents that year. Since then, the Department of Buildings has determined that the use of standoff brackets is not safe. This bill would also codify the prohibition against installing or using standoff brackets. And from the staff on these bills for the entire construction package, I want to thank Audrey Son. That is our legislative agenda today, Madam Majority Leader. I want to thank you all. And with that, I turn it back to you, Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Speaker Johnson. We will now move into discussion of general orders. Seeing that there are no members signed up to speak at this time, we will now move into the report of special committees. None.
Reports of Standing Committees. Report of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing, Intro 2318A, Construction Labor Providers. Amended and coupled on general orders. Intro 2410A, Security Breaches. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Education, Intros 2426A and 2427A, COVID-19 Reporting. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Environmental Protection, Intro 2168A, Water Account Database. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Finance, Preconsidered Resolution 1785, Transparency Resolution. Coupled on general orders. Preconsidered LU 908 and Reso 1786 through Preconsidered LU 910 and Reso 1788, Tax Exemptions. Coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on General Welfare, Intros 1232A and 1233A, Homeless Shelters. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Housing and Buildings, Intros 2262A through 2264A and 2276A, Building Code. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Land Use, LU 847 and Reso 1789, West Harlem Renaissance. Coupled on general orders. LU 848 on page 4 through LU, excuse me, LU 883 on page 9, various applications. Approved with modifications and referred to the City Planning Commission pursuant to section 197D of the New York City Charter. <clears throat> excuse me, LU 884 and Reso 1790 through LU 888 and Reso 1794, Gowanus Canal and Gowanus Mercy Home. Approved and laid over. LU 889 through LU 895, various applications. Approved with modifications and referred to the City Planning Commission pursuant to Section 197D of the New York City Charter. LU 896 and Reso 1795, 624 Morris Avenue rezoning. Coupled on general orders. Preconsidered LUs 912 and 913, 1045 Atlantic Avenue. Approved with modifications and referred to the City Planning Commission pursuant to Section 197D of the New York City Charter. Report of the Committee on Parks and General and recreation, intro 9, 957A, city-owned trees. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a mistake, Mr. Clerk. Report on the Committee on Parks and Recreation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Intro 19, 957A. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Technology, intro 1894A, Automated Employment Decision Tools. Amended and coupled on general orders. General Orders Calendar, LU 842 and Reso 1796 through LU 844 and Reso 1798, River North. Coupled on general orders. Ge <clears throat> Excuse me. General Orders Calendar, LU 859 and Reso 1799 and LU 860 and Reso 1800, 270 Nostrand Avenue. Coupled on general orders. General Orders Calendar, LU 861 and... <clears throat> Reso 1801 and LU 862 and Reso 1802, 1776, 48th Street rezoning. Coupled on general orders. Resolution appointing various persons, commissioner of deeds. Coupled on general orders, and at this time, I'm going to ask the clerk to take a roll call vote on all of the items that are coupled on today's general order calendar. Brennan. Brennan votes aye on all. Brooks Powers. Permission granted. Thank you. I just wanted to really briefly provide remarks for intro 2410A, I'm asking that my colleagues um, join me in support of this legislation, recognizing the need to ensure that we are protecting the, the identity and the personal information of all New Yorkers. I think this is a good bill, and I ask for your support. With that, I vote aye on all. Thank you. Thank you. Reynoso. Moya. Councilmember Moya votes aye on all. Councilmember Powers. Aye on all. Powers votes aye on all. Reynoso. Councilmember Adams. Aye. Councilmember Adams votes aye. Ampri Samuel. Ayala. Aye. Ayala votes aye. Barron. Uh, thank you. I vote aye on all with the exceptions of 842 through 844, 859 through 860, and 861 and 862. Thank you. And, and on the rest, council member? Excuse me, sorry. Yes, I vote aye on all the others. Thank you, council member. Borelli. Permission to briefly explain. Permission granted. 
Uh, thank you. I just want to thank the speaker and Jason, uh, Chris Sartori, and Jeff Baker for the help on passing intro 957. Uh, and I want to thank some of my, my colleagues for supporting the bill, uh, especially in, in the wake of some opposition. I, I do want to be clear what the bill does and doesn't do. Uh, this is the bill about trees, and it sounds like it, it's instinctively against what we stand for. Uh, however, this is still a bill that allows for restitution uh, of the removal of city trees. It still allows for greater restitution when people remove more trees than less. Uh, it allows for greater restitution when people remove bigger trees rather than smaller trees. Uh, however, we wouldn't be here but not for some unfortunate unelected bureaucrats uh, in the Parks Department who took a law that we legislated in 2003 and got it to the point where regular middle-class homeowners were having to pay sometimes six-figure uh, six restitution fees for the crime of having to put a sidewalk in or a parking spot or some other dry well or something required by our own building and zoning code. So this writes sort of a, a, a small wrong for people in the city. It takes away a, a small impediment to home ownership, uh, and it finally uh, equalizes our desire to see trees preserved with sort of the public desire to see sidewalks and parking spots and other things that we require by the zoning. So with that, I vote aye on all, except for land use 842, uh, land use 843 and 844, intros 1894 and 2317. Thank you all. I stand corrected, 2318, excuse me. I can't read my own handwriting clerk, which I'm sure you don't suffer from that problem. Cabrera. Aye. Cabrera votes aye. Chin. I vote aye on all. Councilmember Chin votes aye on all. Cornegie. Aye. Councilmember Cornegie votes aye. Thank you, one moment. Dharma Diaz. Permission granted. Thank you. I want to thank my colleagues here today for intro 2233 and 2233 and 332. It speaks to homeless shelters. And when we say transfer, we're actually saying displacement, which means an eviction notice. So based on our conversation today, we're moving forward. It means that the moment someone DHS decides or case manager decides, they can no longer deal with that client. They can no longer just say, I'm going to send the memo to DHS, I'm going to remove you. We're forcing the system to have a conversation with our people. Housing is a human right, and I thank you for supporting this. Councilmember Dharma Diaz votes yes. Thank you, Councilmember. Ruben Diaz. Dinowitz. Yes. Councilmember Dinowitz votes yes. Councilmember Drum. I vote aye on all with the exception of 957A. Uh, yeah, I vote aye on all with the exception of 957A, and I vote no on that. Eugene. Aye. Eugene votes aye. Councilmember Feliz. Aye on all. Councilmember Feliz votes aye on all. Gennaro. Aye. Gennaro votes aye. Gibson. Councilmember Gibson votes aye on all. Jonai. Councilman, I'll need you to state that on the on the microphone, please. I on all except for intro 1894A and intro 2263A. Thank you. Gordenchik. Permission to briefly explain my vote, Majority Leader? Permission granted. Thank you, Majority Leader, Mr. Speaker. I, I do vote I on all today, and I I want to join the speaker in remembering um, and paying respect to our veterans whose sacrifices and blood uh, have allowed us to, 
to be here today to guide the affairs of our great city. I especially remember um, tomorrow my father, Nathan, who passed away 23 years ago on Veterans Day. My father-in-law, Ira Rothberg, he was an Ira D as well, Mr. Miller, um, a Purple Heart recipient, and my dear friend Alex Jacob, a recipient of two Purple Hearts, one at the Battle of Bulge, all with World War II veterans, and I thank them for what they've done for me and for our nation. And finally, on a happy note, I'm happy to tell you that last trips are back at the Queen's Farm. I won't be able to lobby any of you for money next year if you're coming back, but for those of you who are coming back, please remember the farm. Um, and I want to thank all my colleagues, especially the speaker, uh, for helping to fund the new education center there to the tune of $26 million. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Councilmember Grudenchuk. Holden. I on all except for LU 842, 843, and 844, which I vote no. Thank you. Kalos. Okay. Ku. I will aye on all. Councilmember Ku votes aye on all. Kozlowitz. Councilmember Kozlowitz votes aye on all. Lander. Aye on all except 957 Councilmember, can you use the microphone, please? Thank you. Thank you. I vote aye on all except 957A, on which I abstain. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Levin. Aye on all. Councilmember Levine. Aye on all. Councilmember Levine votes aye on all. Lewis. Aye on Councilmember Lewis votes aye on all. Mizell. Yes. Councilmember Mizell votes yes. Menchaca. Miller. Thank you. Councilmember. Councilmember Miller votes C. Thank you. Perkins. Reynoso. Riley. Councilmember Riley votes aye on all. Rivera. Councilmember Rivera votes aye. Rodriguez. Councilmember Rose. Permission, to explain my vote. Permission granted. I want to thank Speaker Johnson because after months of negotiations and listening to feedback from the public, we've arrived at a proposal for River North that I believe is an appropriate height and density. These approvals will bind the applicant to maintain many upland views of the harbor, even with the proposed reduction in scale. I believe that this project will provide an overall economic benefit to the commercial developments along North Shore and provide desperately needed housing. I heard my constituents' concerns about the precedent-setting nature of the R7 zoning district, and I believe this site is a unique site in a unique location close to the ferry to Lower Manhattan and other job centers in the region. And we have concentrated density that is closer to the ferry. And I believe this project site is an appropriate western boundary to that density. We worked really hard to change the height and density of this project. The applicant has agreed to drop the height of the building number one from 26 stories to 16 stories, a drop in 10 stories, an applicant reduced the height of building two from 25 stories to 11 stories, and building three will remain at 13 stories that are, are allowed regardless of the approval of this rezoning or not. These height reductions have led to a reduction in the total number of proposed units by roughly 20% and 30% of the units will be affordable to families earning an average of 80% AMI. 
We also included a daycare and a food store. The applicant is actively working with daycare providers to locate a daycare on site, which is so critical to our young working families, as well as the potential for a food store on the site, which would be an amenity for the whole neighborhood. Could I have permission to finish my statement? Yes, of course. Thank you. Um, we also ensure that the applicant has made a commitment to staff all three buildings with union service workers. I am also pleased to announce the applicant has agreed to a goal of at least 30% of MWBE subcontractors for this project. The applicant has also agreed to a robust construction workforce development program through a partnership with Building Skills New York, and the applicant plans to participate in the Youth Build Impact Program to give our disconnected young people an opportunity to intern, intern and learn about the construction industry with real life training on the applicant's construction site. There will also be 25 new trees will be planted on the site, including bioswales along, along with other great infrastructure to manage all storm water on site. The project will also include two publicly accessible open spaces, one active and one passive. With all of these considerations, I support the project as modified here, and I ask my colleagues to support this project as well. And I just want to thank, really, um, Speaker Johnson for all of his support, Chair Salamanca and Moya, helping, us to, helping me get through this process. And I want to thank Raju Mann, Arthur Hahn, John Douglas, Amy Levitin for the endless hours that they devoted to this project, and my staff, Christine Johnson, Issa Cortez, and Gary Kane. Thank you. And I vote aye on all. Thank you and congratulations, Councilmember Rose. Councilmember Rosenthal. Uh, permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. Well, I vote aye on all, and I just want to extend my huge congratulations to my sister, Councilmember Rose. You worked your butt off for your community, and you are leaving an amazing legacy for them. You got the buildings lowered down, you got trees planted, you got jobs, you got education, you got daycare. Um, your constituents are really lucky to have you, and I just wanted to congratulate you on the record. Thank you. Salamanca. Councilmember Salamanca votes aye on all. Traeger. Councilmember Traeger votes aye. Ulrich. Vallone. Councilmember Vallone votes aye on all. Van Bramer. Councilmember Van Bramer votes aye. Councilmember Yeager. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I just want to speak, uh, speak briefly about two bills. First, uh, on introduction 957, just to add to Councilmember Borelli's remarks on this, this is something that we would not be here today if the Parks Department wasn't incredibly manipulative and duplicitous in the way that they handled these tree replacement program. The tree replacement program makes sense. We all want trees. I'm waiting five years for the million dollars worth of trees that my predecessor put into the capital budget to finally show up in my district. Some of them have shown up, some of them have not. When you ask them where they are, well, we haven't done a contract. The last contract we did fell apart because that we have a problem with the vendor, and we're waiting and we're waiting and we're waiting. So nobody hates trees, everybody loves trees. But the idea that, that we should require a homeowner who wants to replace a tree to have to pay $200,000 to replace the tree is insane. And the Parks Department would hear nothing. So here we are today, and we did a bill, and it makes sense, and I'm glad that Councilman Borelli did that, and I was proud to add my name to that. On introduction 1894, uh, as I explained to the committee earlier today, I would vote for this bill, but for one part of the bill, and it's something I've spoken about on this floor many, many times, uh, the penalties are for the first violation, $500. All I ask for when we do a new law is, let's make the first violation a warning. Hey, 
we got you. It's a new law. You may not know about it. Here's a warning. Fix what you're doing wrong. Don't do it again, or you're going to get a penalty. I'm not going to vote for a law in this council, in this session, or in the next session that imposes a penalty on a new law that people never heard of before because they violated it accidentally or not for the first time. And so on introduction 1894, I vote no. On uh, land use 842, 843, 844, and the accompanying resolutions 1796, 97, 98, I have respectfully abstain and I on all the remainder. Thank you very much. Did you guys get that? Yes. We're good. Uh, Council Member Kalos. Aye on all. Council Member Kalos votes aye on all. One, one moment. Matteo. Thank you. I'm voting no on land use 842, 843, and 844. Uh, General Order 1894 and no on 2318 as well. And aye on the rest. Thank you. Combo. I vote aye on all. Speaker Johnson. I vote aye on all. All items on today's general order calendar are adopted by a vote of 42 in the affirmative, zero negative, and zero abstentions. With the exception of intro 1894A, which was adopted by a vote of 38 in the affirmative, four negative, and zero abstentions. And intro 2318-A, which was adopted by a vote of 40 in the affirmative, two negative, and zero abstentions. LUs A42, 843, 844, and accompanying results which was adopted by a vote of 37 in the affirmative, four negative, and one abstentions. LUs 859, 860, and accompanying resos, which was adopted by a vote of 41 in the affirmative, one negative, and zero abstentions. And LUs 861, 862, and accompanying resos, which was adopted by a vote of 41 in the affirmative, one negative, and zero abstentions. Intro 957A, which was adopted by a vote of 40 in the affirmative, one negative, and one abstention. And intro 2263A, which was adopted by a vote of 41 in the affirmative, one negative, and zero abstentions. Thank you to all of my colleagues. And now we will move into the introduction and reading of bills. All bills have been referred to committees as indicated on today's agenda. Thank you. There are no resolutions on today's calendar, so we will move into general discussion. And we will begin in this order, Council Members Dinowitz, Matteo, and Holden. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. Um, it's wonderful to celebrate uh, Puerto Rican Heritage Month, uh, Diwali. Um, and as we celebrate, it's also important to remember times of sorrow and pain, uh, and 83 years ago was Kristallnacht, uh, a night when Nazis and even Nazi Hitler youth broke windows in shuls, set schools on fire, and beat up Jewish people in the streets. 
I like to think that this is some distant memory. 83 years ago seems like a long time. Yet this year in my community, shuls had bricks and rocks thrown into them. In Brooklyn schools, Jewish schools, yeshivas were lit on fire. And throughout the city, Jewish people were beaten up. Uh, Anti-Semitism is on the rise. Um, and so I do want to take a moment to thank those of you who have stood with the Jewish community, not just with a tweet saying Happy Hanukkah. I'm saying in times of difficulty and, and pain for us, standing side by side with us, I thank those of you who take Holocaust education very seriously. Because if we are silent, we will continue to repeat what has happened as we are seeing this year. I thank those of you who stand with the Jewish community and I look forward to working with any one of you, every single one of you, to come together, not just for the Jewish community, but for every community that we can all work together and build bridges and love and empathy between all communities. Thank you. Thank you. Council, Council Member Matteo. Council Member Holden. Thank you. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, a bill I introduced today, uh, intro 2452. The bill will help the city and, and end illegal pop up parties that affect our quality of life. It's a new phenomenon that we're seeing a lot around the city. These parties are more than a nuisance uh, that increases noise in residential areas. Two shootings in my district were connected to event spaces that aren't following city laws. Pop-up parties are increasingly a tinderbox for illegal activity. My bill will impose significant penalties on any business that does not have a certificate of assembly and is selling drinks. Under the proposed law, the Department of Buildings can fine businesses between $1,000 and $25,000 per hazardous violation. This bill was crafted to ensure that we are, punished, we are only punishing illegal pop-up parties and not legitimate businesses. I urge my colleagues to sign on to this bill, and together we can not only end illegal pop-up parties, but stop more serious crimes before they occur. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilmember Holden. Councilmember Koo, and we will then close the meeting. Thank you, Majority Leader. Quiet uh, in the chamber. I would, like to, uh, I would like to extend my gratitude to my communication director and deputy chief, chief of staff, Scott Sieber, for his six years of wonderful service to our office and our community. Thank you, Scott, and all the best for your new endeavors. Thank you. I stand corrected. Council Member Adams. Keep it down, please. Keep it down. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. Today, I'm introducing a pair of bills related to public safety that will improve accountability for misconduct by law enforcement. Resolution 1782 calls on the state legislature to pass and the governor to sign the Wandering Officers Act. This state legislation prohibits the appointment of a person to the position of police officer if he or she has previously been fired as a police officer from another jurisdiction. This is an important bill because those whom we have entrusted to protect and serve our communities then violated that trust should not be rewarded with another opportunity if they have a record of wrongdoing. And intro 2440, which would authorize the Civilian Complaint Review Board to initiate complaints. It's a long overdue measure to empower the CCRB, which currently does not have the ability to investigate cases if they were not filed by the public. This is a significant reform that brings further accountability where it is needed. I encourage my colleagues to sign on to both of these bills. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Councilmember Adams. Councilmember Chen. Thank you, Majority Leader. I just want to share some good news with all my colleagues. All this right. morning, I was in Chinatown 
with Governor Hogel to announce that we won the Downtown Revitalization Initiative. $20 million will be invested in Chinatown to help the community rebuild. And I just wanted to also thank our borough president, who promised us that Chinatown is going to be the one that she's going to push for, and we got the grant. So I just want to share the good news that Chinatown is going to come back strong after all the suffering from COVID. So I just want to share the good news. And thank you to all my colleagues for your support. Congratulations, Margaret. Thank you for closing us out on such a high note, Council Member Chin. I will now call on Speaker Corey Johnson to close today's stated meeting. Three stated meetings left in this city council. But we're who's get, counting? We're getting to the end. The stated meeting of November 10th, 2021 is hereby adjourned. <laughs>